Hello and welcome back to the Premier Injuries Channel. Today we welcome onto the show Tom Little, PhD. You're the head of performance at Sheffield United, a skill-based conditioning expert, personal trainer, and you focus on athlete well-being. But you're also founder of ColorFit, which we are going to be talking about today. But first and foremost, Tom, how are you doing today? <laughs> I'm very well, thank you, Jason. I uh, feel good that it's fi finally started raining outside, which I thought had never quite come out of my mouth during my lifetime. But uh, yeah, it feels nice to cool, cool down and I'm absolutely delighted to be on the show. So thanks very much for the invite. No, it's a pleasure and, and genuinely really looking forward to this discussion because I've enjoyed the book. But for those listening, do you want to give like a, a little kind of snippet into what ColorFit is and how it's going to help simplify nutrition, especially for athletic performance? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I'd like to say the concept is more for a not really designed just for athletes. It works for anyone. The reason that I invented it is that young footballers I typically work with probably have far worse nutrition habits than the general public. And so their need for that simplification and practicality was even greater than what the general public is. But the, the concept just applies for absolutely anyone. It just so happens that my professional career has already always been in professional sports. So that was the easiest thing to introduce a concept. But right from the birth of it, I knew that it, it was something that everybody needs. Everybody had problems around nutrition being a bit over complex, a bit impractical, a bit rigid, not based on science. So those were the fundamental kind of problem solving areas that I, I decided to tackle. So yeah, I, I've been trying to tackle nutrition and improve it with my athletes for 20 odd years and just found it such a difficult task despite throwing so many resources of it. So I, I took a step back and looked at what the problems are. And then, like I said, how can I solve that? And the first point was around the simplification of identifying foods that are going to be appropriate to achieve your goal. So for everybody, they generally fall into three categories of you want to improve your health, you want to change your body shape or maintain your body shape, or you want to improve your performance or your kind of energy levels for activity. So those were the three categories. And we thought, can we divide meals into those categories? And we found out the two of large large extent that we could so we decided to we made something called the health score that looked at all the kind of vitamins uh, minerals fiber um good fats and the likes all elements are important to your health and we found a way to quantify that and called that health made it gold for golden glow and put a heart hike onto it so there's three layers of intuition for all the different goals that we're aiming for a color a name and an icon for performance um carbohydrates fits into that nicely because it's our most efficient form of energy so it allows us to perform at our maximum levels so we gave that a green colour, green for go. We gave it a running man icon um, and called that performance fuel. And then finally, we have body shape and we thought protein fits into that nicely because it has the highest, it makes us fullest for the longest, it has the lowest net calories and it boosts our metabolism as well. We got, give that red colour for a burning metabolism, give it a six pack icon and call that lean muscle. Also, calories are super important. So we wanted a nice intuitive level to that as well. So we invented like the speed gauge that we called the cal calorie load dial. And that just, again, very intuitive. How full that is um, represents the calories within a meal. So if it's really full up, it's obviously high. If it's low, it's low. So the proportions of the goals that we talked about, that fits in like a pie chart at the center of the plate. And then the color fit gauge works around the outside. And thankfully, that looked just like a plate when I put it all together. And hey-ho, the color fit kind of system was born. Now, that, it doesn't sound simple when you describe it because it's such a visual stimulus um but if anyone wants to have a, a quick look at it you can jump on the amazon and look for the book uh, the color fit method or you can go on our website which is hero pro sports and you'll get a nice 
graphical image that will paint a picture of what I've just been rubbing it on about there <laughs> for about half an hour. And you'll see how simplistic it is. So we got to this point where our players, our athletes were able to choose a meal really intuitive that's going to be appropriate for what they need to do. The next stage was like getting them to choose. It was probably the easy bit. It's then getting them to actually make the thing. It's adapt changing their behavior because a lot of them are really scared and intimidated by the kitchen so at this point we decided to make short little meal video demonstrations for every single one of our meals and that was the real turning point where people like i said they found it quite intimidating disengaged with nutrition really found it quite absorbing they were chatting about it in the morning and all of a sudden i thought I'm actually onto something here. So we developed the idea, made it a much kind of more whole holistic uh, app around nutrition. It was colour fit method then. I knew I had to take it to a larger scale because everyone wants a be bespoke app when you talk about anything to do with anything these days. So I joined with a company called Hero Wellbeing that had a holistic uh, wellbeing app. They wanted my nutrition element to sit in their, uh, their platform. Um, so it came in and then it exists on its own within pro sport and the wellbeing space. It's a nutritional app. Um, and yeah, that's been rebranded to Hero Pro now. So if you're looking for anything to do with the brand or uh, the social or anything like that, it's around Hero Pro or Hero Pro Sports. So that was the journey to that point. And then we added lots of elements that helped problem solve around the behaviors of nutrition. So we added fancy gizmos like any meal that you can choose, you can generate a shopping list and get those ingredients uh, delivered to your door. Um, it's got lots of, uh, you can buy meals directly on there. It's got like its own uh, meal logger and barcode function, which uh, you can log your meals on there, but you can also get an expert to jump on your platform as well, review your meals and write yourself meal, meal plans as well. So that creates a nice behavioral loop of uh, execute, plan, review, and go again. So that's been really good. And it's been huge. That aspect's been hugely uh, successful in pro sport. We've got over 100 users, all different elements of sport, football mainly, but also rugby, cricket, national governing bodies at several levels, that far as Nor Norway and Australia. So that's been super pleasing and rewarding, particularly as I'm from pro sport. But like I said, very, at the very beginning, I always knew it was a concept that could work for the general public because they had the same problems and the easiest way to accompany that I thought would be the book so uh, but about four years later at the point that the book's been released now and um, I'm hoping it can help the general public as much as it's helped athletes out there. And just in that story of how intuitive or how easy it is to use, you based it on your son didn't you? That That was where the initial interaction was. Yeah, but more than my son, I've got to thank Apple, I must say, so, because it was the fact that he could just pick up my phone and I haven't told him a thing what to do and he's six-year-old and he's using it far better than I can. It's just that cleverness in design that lends itself to just intuitive behaviour. So these are incredible technique, like far beyond my mind, but it was that kind of thinking. I was thinking, these guys, they just need to look at it and know what to do. So that was the whole concept. How can I get down to that layer and then by imparting it to what their goals are that, that they wanted to achieve, shaping everything towards that, I thought that, that was the easiest layer of intuition. So to go back to my son, as I watched him do it, I started to think and design these ideas and he was then clambering all around me and it, he started to say, well, that makes you healthy, that makes you run. So that was a kind of aha moment that I thought, well, might have a chance of getting this message over to some footballers. Yeah, no, it's brilliant. And, and I like that kind of personal element to the book as well, you know, bringing it to, to where, you know, it started at home. But I, I do want to start at the beginning, I guess, of individuals' journeys then. Uh, how does one kind of go about identifying their goals? Uh, how, how do you make sure that they're going on the right path? Because this is described in the book. Person A 
want to improve their fitness, what kind of questions do they have to ask themselves before they, they kind of even get on that journey to being started? I think if you look at nutrition, I think the vast, vast majority of people, they pick up any nutrition book because they typically want to lose weight. Um, so that is a journey that a lot of them will just inherently know and, and, and it is ingrained in their mind and hence they bought the book. Very much intertwined with that is health. Health is, should always be the most dominant factor in sport and, and nutrition, sorry. So people think about health and think it's boring and bland and things like that, but it, it, it needs to be far, far from that. Just simple little skills around cooking methods and seasoning and herbs and the likes and dressings, and you can easily make vegetables, salads and the like, the, the most, some of the most delicious foods that you eat. And, and it's simple. I, I'm not a good chef, hence this all came about so organically. And I think why it's done well, I, I really struggle as well. So all the recipes that we choose within, like with, there's over 120 odd in the book and over 400 on the app, every single one of them has to be simplistic to make. You'll never find a long, complicated list of ingredients. But at the same time, we make real efforts to make sure it's as tasty as possible because no one's going to go back and make a meal if they, they don't enjoy it. So that's always the fundamental foundations. But also every recipe has to come from a health or performance perspective. So inherently, all our meals are going to be lend themselves easily to most people's goals. So health and weight maintenance are the most common goals that you see in there. And they tend to go hand in hand because a huge part of weight maintenance is health. A healthy diet, one that's rich in, as I mentioned before, vegetables, salads, fruits and the likes, nuts and seeds. Um, these diets really, really help with weight maintenance as well as boosting our energy levels, our health, our immunity, our inflammation, the list just goes on and on. Our disease prevention, they have a huge effect on our weight maintenance, which is probably the most dominant risk to health in the Western world at the moment. Factors relating to diabetes, metabolic disease, obesity, again. So all these things are kind of intertwined as well. But going back to what we're saying about health, if you eat a healthy diet, things like vegetables tend to be large volume, but quite low calories. So they make us feel full as we're eating them. They have hugely important nutritional elements in there that make us feel full as well. They have fat, typically have fiber in them. So fiber just gets basically passed through the body and absorbed as calories and really helps with our digestive system. It also acts as a food for all our, all our kind of microbiome, which are all kind of our bugs and things that live within us, which has been shown to be super important to our weight maintenance as well. And then our bodies basically react to the nutrients we receive. So if it's not getting nutrients, these vitamins and minerals and, and good fats and the likes, it keeps on sending out hunger signals. It needs these nutrients in the body. So if you're having a poor quality diet, you will feel hungrier because your body is still crying out for these elements that it needs for basic functioning. So you have a healthy diet that really interlays itself into weight maintenance plus all the other benefits as well. The other thing that goes in, as I mentioned before, that we talk about lean muscle as being important to body composition is protein is really important for if we want to um, have a lean body composition as well because as i mentioned before it has the lowest net calories of all our macronutrients so uh lower than slightly lower than carbohydrates but a lot lower than fats it's the highest satiety nutritional element that we get so that means it makes us feel fuller for longer and makes us feel fuller sooner so that's super important as well it actually boosts our metabolism slightly when we eat it particularly if we combine it with some form of strength training if we tone or increase our muscle size muscle is actually a quite an active metabolic tissue so if you have more muscle you're burning more energy all the time not just when you're lifting your weights and things when you're asleep at night, when you're sitting on your couch and watching EastEnders or whatever, you're burning more calories 24-7. And that what you call your basic uh, metabolism, 
energy that you burn just through natural processes of keeping the body alive, that for virtually everybody is our biggest energy expenditure by a mile. So if we can affect that, it's really important to our overall health. And then again, these things tie in as well. So performance or activity, that's going to tie in with weight maintenance and health. So if somebody has the goal of weight maintenance and health, the best one of the best ways apart from nutrition they can eat it is to go out and do some exercise. To do exercise well, if you want to do it at a, a decent level, then requires that you consume some carbohydrates around that to give you the fuel that you need to perform that activity well. The things that I got from it was being realistic with your goals uh, and you've you've actually repeated the point there that identify foods that you like because I, I think quite often people when they go into diets or health or lifestyle they think it's about taking stuff away from themselves and, and maybe that's a negative attitude they should look at the positive and go i can have these foods but in kind of moderation i, I can still enjoy life basically with complementing it with with the fun lifestyle of working out basically yeah definitely food is really one of life's biggest enjoyment so if you're just a, a, taking it from kind of just a, a really rigid bland viewpoint that you're not going to be successful long term and you're going to form a bad relationship with food like i said food is an absolute joy we all have things that we know they're not necessarily good for us a majority of us know foods that are good and bad for us it's the actual behaviors of of carrying out what what we should and shouldn't be doing so i eat chocolate every single day but i will have it in moderation i quite like dark chocolate as well which is slightly better for us from a, a good fat profile as well um so i would always encourage people to have a certain amount of regular treats in their diet because we 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 should enjoy life and get the most of we can out with it. And it goes back to what I'm saying, healthy foods are good diets that are going to achieve our goal. They don't have to be bland. They don't have to be rigid. If you look at the most healthy people in these blue zone diets around the world, they eat a vast array of different foods and really enjoy their meal towns to sit down with a family and have this vast array of different bright, colourful foods that are, have a whole range. But what you see with that type of foods are the whole foods, the natural foods that are found within nature that we can either catch or kill or grow that we've evolved to eat over millions and millions of years. In modern diets, we're eating over 70% ultra-processed foods that have a lot of the natural nutritional elements taken away from them and then uh, things that are not good for our health added to them, things like fats, uh, things like salt, artificial colorings. So that's a good way of kind of approaching just a generalistic view of something that's going to be a diet that's enjoyable and good for us. Is it mainly whole food based? So can you, can, is it like a fruit, a vegetable, a salad? Is it uh, a meat? Is it nuts and seeds? Is it something along those lines? Is it a legume? Um, something that, you, like I said, you can grow or can, can be caught, but we evolved to having our diet over millions of years. And it goes back to everybody thinks that I'm going to struggle to cook things, but very little amount of knowledge and following simplistic re recipes. If you just give it a go, it, you'll find that meals that are going to be really good for you can also be super bowl, enjoyable to make and also tasty as well. And we have something in there as well called meal builders. So meal builders are kind of a type of meal that you can very easily make a huge variety of. So things like stir fries, salads, tray rolls, casseroles, overnight oats, pancakes, sandwiches and the likes. And what we do, rather than just saying follow this recipe, we try and teach people the basic principles of how to build that meal, but do it in a way that's going to support your goal and also make it tasty at the same time as well. And that way we're not just saying, right, follow this recipe. We're actually encouraging cooking independence because nutrition is so nuanced. If you just tell someone to follow a rigid meal plan, it never works because everybody's got different tastes, different kind of social circumstances, different cultural circumstances, kids, economics, all these things that affect 
what they eat. So they need to have ownership on what they're, what they're putting on their plate. Um, so if you can teach them that, it's a lot better than just hitting them with recipe after recipe after recipe as well. And when people start fitness journeys, they, I think they often encounter mistakes. There's a lot of conflicting misinformation out there. What do you think is the biggest error that you see people making at the start? Carb phobia is a huge one, I think. I think carbs have just been really demonised, both not in valid scientific literature, but in books that you would think would be coming from valid people. And there can be lots of anecdotal research. And if you do go on a keto diet, or the old Atkins diet, as you called it, it is an effective way of losing weight, but it's mainly effective way of losing weight because you have, one, you're having less calories because there's far less foods to chew from. There's less water in the body because uh, carbohydrates cling to three uh, grams of water for every gram of carbs. So there's, a, there's a lot of water weight, which is not necessarily unhealthy weight in there. But So it might work in the short term, but what you see in the long term with the, these type of diets is that people just can't adhere to them because it's difficult in terms of the range of foods that you're eating, particularly if, if you're out and about and you don't feel good on these diets long-term as well, because you're restricting a lot of nutritional elements that are really important in the diet. Fiber that we've already mentioned that comes from a lot of carbohydrate sources. Um, that's going to have a massive effect on your microbiome biome as well. And we have something from our vegetables, our salads, and lots of plant food called phytonutrients. So there's over tens of thousands of these phytonutrients out there, and they're generally what give the colour to our different plant foods. But they also offer really protective effects against uh, disease for all these uh, plant species. And when we eat them, they infer those benefits to us as well. So it's been shown on a lot like Mediterranean diet, diets that are hugely uh, impactful on, on colourful plants on there that they're so beneficial to health, they're beneficial to specific de- disease risk it, risks as well. And if, like I say, if you're just ignoring carbohydrates, one, it's impractical, but two, it's uh, you, you're going to end up missing some really important nutritional element in your diet as well. And therefore, in the long term, you see a lot of yo-yo uh, effects with the weight in there and you, you see very poor lack of long-term adherence as well. I think the, the most correct thing to do, backed by the empirical evidence, backed by the literature as well as what we've already talked about, adjusting how, mu- how much carbs you're having in your diet based on how a- active you are, which can be quite complex when it's coming to whole foods because they're generally a good mix of all the macronutrients, so they're a good mix of your carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. And that's why we invented the Colour Fit Plate, to make it really easy. But it do, I'm doing myself a disservice in the book a bit. It doesn't have to be. You don't have to have a Colour Fit Plate. There's loads of guides out there, like the, um, the Healthy Eating Guide that's on the NHS and how to build a, a healthy plate out there that just simply categorises foods into different areas and how much you should generally be having on your plate and you, you won't go far wrong there. And it, like my general advice for everybody is just to try and have lots of uh, plant-based foods in there, so lots of vegetable salads and fruit, and then generally a good source of protein within your meal, and you're not going to go far wrong if you do, do that. And, and protein doesn't just have to be meat and fish and protein powders, uh, although they are good sources. If you're a vegetarian or vegan, you can get more than enough protein for things like your beans, uh, your legumes, um, lots of wholemeal carbohydrates have very high uh, protein levels like uh, brown rice, uh, oats are really up there, quinoa as well. And also kind of your substitution products as well. So soya braced products, which is lots of like uh, tofu and tempu and all the yogurts and the milks and nut based milks in there are excellent as well. And things like mycoprotein as well. So there's lots and lots of good uh, protein sources out there that are pretty simple to get in the diet. 
Uh, we got a listener question on this one. They've asked, what foods slash vitamins are specifically beneficial for cardiovascular performance? And on the flip side, what is most harmful? Most harmful? I'll start with beneficial. So in terms of cardiovascular performance, because they linked it to performance in there, beetroot has got a lot of... Um, a lot of hype recently because it contains something that's called nitrates. It's also contained in uh, green leaf, the salads and vegetables, things like spinach, kale, and the likes also have nitrates in there. And what they do, it's a vasodilatory effect on our arteries. So basically they get wider and it allows us to pump more blood to our muscles, to our heart, and that's found to be super beneficial as well. I like a, a spot of uh, red wine and uh, <laughs> that's been shown to have nutritional elements that are in there and they're in grapes and the cherries and the likes as well. Um, let me think that's bad for the heart. Obviously, saturated fat. This fat is a really controversial topic, but I think irrelevantly, the evidence says that saturated fat contained in things like poor quality red meats, like your sausages, your bacon, um, and the likes, generally red meats. Some red meat, if it's organically grown or, or grass-fed or done well, has a greater amount of fats that are good for us called uh, omega-3 fats in there. Um, so you don't have to demonize red meat, but it's not something that you'd want on your plate every single day of the week. A couple of the times, a couple of times a week is certainly sufficient to give us a good amount of iron. It's probably the most bioavailable source of iron, which is important for a number of elements. But yeah, um, saturated fat contained in things like what I said there, but it's also present in uh, full fat dairy, in things, uh, lots of confectionaries, chocolates, ice creams and the like. That tends to be the fat, fats that are bad for us. But there's lots of fats that have been proven to be good for our cardiovascular health as well. So we've got omega-3 fats, which are found in like cold water fish, like salmon and mackerel, also to a lower extent in things like nuts and seeds and olive oil, um, rapeseed oil as well. So they're good things to regular habit have in the diet as well. And un generally unsaturated fats are good for us. So things like avocado, uh, contains those as well um olives and the likes so yeah they're good for us um but remember when you're taking on fat it's double the calories of other macronutrients as well so even though it is healthy if you're concerned around weight maintenance you don't want to be just having a diet that's constantly putting avocado and nuts and seeds into smoothies all day they are great foods i'm not demonizing those foods in every way but if losing weight or weight maintenance is really your highest end goal, then maybe you want to have those in your diet, but not in vast, vast quantities. Now, one area that I find a lot of conflicting information is timing. When to eat around exercise, sleep. I mean, can you clear up maybe if, if I ask certain time periods, uh, do you mind kind of maybe clearing up? So first of all, how close do you have to eat before exercise to, to have kind of maximal benefits to, to be able to power you through? It's really, if you're doing a long endurance exercise, it's the day before that's most important. So then you're going to have enough time within your body to transfer it from your digestive system into your muscles. And then you, you're not going to be around the time that you're going to exercise. So you have that digestive discomfort discomfort as you're getting closer to the exercise you, you want to lessen the amount but maybe more concentrated amount so drinks is a good source around there energy cell gels is, is a good source but it's massive massively dependent on how hard you're exercising the typical likes of me and you that you just go in uh, and just doing about an hour's exercise you don't really have to worry about refueling while you're exercising or just before if you've had moderate amount of carbohydrates building up to it will be fine and we'll be able to perform fine and, and we'll do well um afterwards if it's really important to, that you re-energize and you've got a, an important activity it's quite important to have carbohydrates afterwards but unless you're doing really high-end performance that is going to last 
longer than an hour, you don't really have to worry about taking on carbohydrates while you're exercising. If you're getting above an hour and a half up to two hours, the recommendation is to have between about 30 up to the ultra elite might have about 90 grams per hour. So for again, for the likes of me and you, we're running a marathon for the first time. That'll be things like just having a couple of swigs of an energy drink and maybe an energy gel every hour that'll put us up to about 40 grams. And that's going to be something that we can probably tolerate with our digestion. It's not going to make, want to make us do a Paul Radcliffe on the road or anything like that. <laughs> and it'll help our performance as well. But I think it's a little bit overhyped, obviously, to sell their product. What the average Joe needs when they're coming up to exercise, we can get them from our whole food sources, from oats, from brown versions of our pastas, our breads healthy cereals like granolas, uh, and it's obviously in a lot of vegetables as well. So it, it, it's quite easy to achieve and not something that you overly have to worry about unless you go into those higher ends of performance where you're really pushing the body for extensive periods. And I guess the post-exercise as well, you hear people say, oh, you have to have a certain amount of carbohydrates and protein straight after to, to grow your muscles or to recover properly. Is there any truth to that? And, and I guess as well, bring it back to the book, what kind of uh, color wheel would you recommend for that post-exercise recovery phase? So you'd, you'd be looking for one that's dominantly green and red. So it's going to have your performance fuel in there and your lean muscle. So you're recovering your fuel stores and you're also promoting muscle repair and growth. So quite obvious, the name's make it obvious for what you should be looking to go and you want a reasonably high calorie load in there as well so the calories will be then sufficient you'll be getting a sufficient protein you'll be getting sufficient amount of carbohydrates that are going to refuel and repair us as quickly as possible again for the average likes of me and you there isn't an emergency on the time frame as long as we achieve an adequate amount over the day will pretty much get where we need to get to. It's for somebody that, again, is going to have to recover. So my, my performance this year, they've got two games a week every single week of the season because of the Winter World Cup. So there's going to be a huge promotion that these guys have to recover super quick. And that's where the slightly better, we release certain chemical signals when we kind of utilize uh, all our muscle reserves in there. So there's something called GLUT4 that transports carbohydrate molecules across into the muscles. They tend to be higher after we exercise. Um, so there is a slight biological and physiological reason why giving them the protein and the carbohydrates sooner will have a slightly increased effect, but it's not as big as we first used to uh, promote. It's almost done for convenience because we've got such a short time frame. If we're getting them straight away, we can then get them the next hour and the next hour after that. So it's just having repeated windows where we can give them opportunities to refuel and repair. So doing it quite early just gives us more windows. It also gives us a slight biological advantage. But unless you're do, doing something super important quite quickly, don't oversweat it. Most of us don't feel like eating just after exercise. So a nice carbohydrate solution or uh, something like a, a milkshake or something like that, that'll have your carbohydrates, that'll have your protein. You don't have to be spending fortunes. You can just have a pint of milk and that'll get you pretty much where you need to get to. Fascinating. Yeah. And I guess as well, another one is sleep. People say don't eat too f close to sleep because you'll put on fat. Is that another bit of misinformation though? There's a few th things in there that have some semblance of truth around them. Number one, are you going to sleep very well if your digestive system's working and sleep is absolutely imperative to help? And then there's two things around um, eating later on. When we eat later on, it tends to be poorer food choices because the body's shutting down, we start to feel tired and we can miscue those signals for the body shutting down as low energy and whatnot. So we go for that kind of quick fix of sugar. So 
we just find ourselves without even knowing what we're doing, just in our snack cupboard or in front of the fridge. And it's almost mindless eating and they tend to be convenient things that are higher in sugars, higher in fats as well. So you tend to have poorer choices at night and we might like lots of us say Netflix and chill and the likes and that turns into Netflix and let's have a whatever it is, a, a tub of ice cream to enjoy this. And I get that. It's a link between kind of doing an activity, enjoy it when we go to the cinema. We love going to the cinema as much for the food because we, we treat ourselves. So you know, that's not the end of the world. But if you're doing it every night, you, you've got to accept that the consequences, you're having poor, poor food, food choices all the time. It's just good habits most of the time. Like I said at the beginning, you don't need to be an angel. The final thing with it is it's a lot of research around fasting and intermittent fasting. You'll hear that all the time where you only eat for a shortened window of a day and therefore you have a prolonged period where your body's not getting nutrients from fasting. So fasting has been shown to have beneficial effects both for weight loss and also health. And it's to do with lowered insulin levels for a certain pound and lots of kind of genetic signals that relate to kind of uh, low energy availability. It's quite complex, but the actual practical outcome isn't that complex at all. Most people can't fast for a prolonged period. It's just too difficult. We feel hungry, et cetera. Um, but a dead easy thing to do is to just tie that a little window onto sleep. So you've got, like most of us, will have a good window of sleep. So if you don't eat for a period before then, or don't eat for a period after then, um, it just prolongs that fasting window and basically not taking on as m many calories overall. That that seems to be the big thing. Most of us are over-consuming calories just because they're around us all the time and we're hardwired to take on calories for evolution survival over millions of years when food was quite scarce. What's actually been shown with the two methods of do you... Um, fast before you go to sleep or fast afterwards. Go, the one going before you go to sleep has been proven to be slightly more advantageous because later on in the day, we have an elevated uh, response to carbohydrates in terms of insulin release and things like that. So we tend to store more of that food that we're eating late at night and burn less fat because of that. So it's not massive, but it's been shown to be slightly beneficial. So that's something in my, what I try and follow in my diet. I try and stop eating by about seven and then start eating from about eight the next day. And that's about 13 hours window where I'm not taking on calories. And that's been proven to be pretty beneficial. Uh, I want to move it on. Very to doable. Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> No, 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 that's fine. Um, I mean, uh, well, I'm sure people are more interested in listening to you anyway, so don't worry, Tom. Um, in terms of it, then, I, I want to talk a little bit about the success of what you've done so far, because I found it fascinating kind of reading the book and looking at it. You know, you, you've said that it's had such an impact on players' lives already. So can you talk us through the successes that you have seen uh, on a practical level, because, you know, quite often with these these diets and things, people find it hard to relate to because they don't know the success rates, whereas you, you're you there, you're seeing it every day, the impact that you've had on, uh, I guess, footballers are average people that just play sport for a living, don't they? Yeah, I mean, it's hard to put, it's, it's multifactorial, definitely, and a bit of luck in there and, and this uh, the sphere that I work in that's coming. But there's loads of things that have contributed. So, number one, it's entirely organic where it's come from. I didn't design this to write a book or create an app. I designed it to try and not get fired from my lads being overweight and not performing well. It was a genuine journey of how can I help these people? And that if you're in performance fear and you're not solely focused on trying to help people, you're not going to last long. That That is part of us. So my nutritional aspect of that was, right, I really need to help these players feel better, feel like have less risk of injury, feel better, perform better and just have to take care of themselves better from a holistic perspective. So I was desperate to do that. And like I say, it's just that journey of problem solving, of getting to there, coming up with an original concept that one out that does work, that is ultra simplistic, that, that was 
really big part of it. And then obviously the practical side of it, the practical side is everything because it's not what you know, it's what you do. So that's where the, all the videos and the book contains QR links to video demonstrations of all the over 120 recipes in there. So that's super important in terms of making it as practical as possible. So I knew it just worked so well with where I was working. And then I'm fortunate enough because I've worked for over 20 years, I have a good network within sport and I was just started to put it out there a little bit i've generated this idea do you want to have a look at it at the time it just existed on google drive so it was free for me to basically there was no kind of uh, development cost to it which believe me when you create the real thing it's absolutely ginormous so and it just took off i think the timing was great nutrition was really coming up there wasn't something anywhere and people just got it there's once you see it visually in action it's so simple. You just get it. And like, I, we all have this problem and this has solved it. So it doesn't matter who you are. Everybody in the world eats. It's not kind of something that's super specialized. It involves everybody. So that's where it started to take off really well. I had some really high profile clients, about half the Premier League using it, half the Scottish Premier League using it as well. But it was just a little old me with not much finance. It's a full-time job behind me that and so I had to get somebody in to help that was a hero well-being journey and the rebrand to hero pro uh, and that's just got loads of all the bells and whistles that I've talked about it to make it a true kind of behavioral changing app as well so people obviously bought into that as one of the best uh, products on the market and then <laughs> with the book I just I just like again my pure naivety if I, if I knew about apps and things like that, I'd have never gone down there because it's once you're in there, you realise what a scary world is. I knew nothing about books as well, so all I did was like, uh, I've got a few Joe Wicks books. I looked on the internet, who's Joe Wicks uh, publishing uh, agent? Found uh, Jonathan Conway, wrote him an email. He loved the concept, obviously the law of elite sport in there as well, but got it that it was going to be useful for everyone, and managed to get some really good publishers interested. Went with Little Brown, who's done must say I'm so chuffed with what how they've designed and brought it back and how they guided me to make sure it was suitable the language was entertaining as well and efficient for uh, your lay person on there and like I said a lot of luck a lot of good timing but a good concept at the heart of it I'm probably doing myself a bit of a disservice there because it, it's got several bespoke factors on there that didn't exist the color fit methodology the simple video demonstrations for every single meal the meal builder concept um all the meal plans that we designed from everyone and in the book as well we've also designed the training concept um you might be able to put that on your show notes that we've also designed this what we call um the training load gauge and it works on similar model to the the color fit plate model that uses icons colors and gauges to make it really intuitive and it tells you what type of training you're going to be doing how hard it's going to be and then there's video demonstrations for everything to make it super simple and practical again so if there's an exercise there's always a qr link to the demonstration if there's a circuit whatever it may be there's a link to show you how to do that circuit so Simple, practical, all the way through. And that's what everybody needs if they're going to live by and adaptable. So we try and give a good rationale to ev everything that we do. So it's not just copy it. You understand why you're doing this type of training, this type of nutrition. Take that and put it into your real world circumstances and make it work. Yeah, I, I think that's one of the, the beautiful things about the book. Every bit interlinked so that it makes it so, so easy. It's, it's kind of like we said almost at the beginning that it's having the realistic goals, but then being able to see how to achieve them. You're, you're guided along every bit of the way. I want to maybe look at history, though, a little bit. You've mentioned a few times, you know, your history within the sport. You've been there for a while. And in the modern generation, we've got the the kind of massive examples of the super professionals like the Ronaldos, the Messis. Uh, but generally across the board, it seems like diet, exercise, everything to do with player well-being is now super scientific. How much difference have you seen change uh, with the modern players versus the past that has one of the big shifts been in mentality to embrace the new, the scientific? 
Yeah, I mean, things have changed enormously from when I first started. You'd, there'd be steak and chips for pre-match and things like that. The Liverpool great team, that was what they had every time, but everyone was doing that, so it wasn't such a big thing and there was fairly widespread drinking culture across the game as well. And then it's people coming in and, and taking it to a different level. So in my mind, Arsene Wenger is a huge one with that. He brought a huge level of elitism and professional for his team. And all of a sudden, when somebody becomes so much better than everyone else, everyone has to react to that. And, and therefore, professional standards have come in. The emergence of just performance and sports science and the global support team of um, football, any elite sport really has been super important. So when I first started, it was just, there'd be a couple of coaches, there'd be a physio, there's yourself, and you're covering everything, so you're a bit of an odd job, Rod. But now you have specialists in every position that are working full-time and you might have a couple of nutritionists with one team and they're really working on evolving that and taking it forward. Um Having said that, you'd be amazed at how many bad practices there are out there. I'd say generally, your young footballer coming through that's not at the top top level are eating far worse than your general public member because they're eating out all the time. They're suddenly thrown in to live on the big bad world on their own at 18 where they've had everything done for them up to that point. And they're so genetically gifted and super active, burning so many calories of the day that they can get away with it. They're almost bulletproof from that point of kind of around about 80 <laughs> up to a kind of the mid twenties. They can get away with some bad stuff. But after that point, it starts to catch up with it. And it'll affect them before then in terms of performance. But as you're getting past that window where you're not as bulletproof, things to do with mood, inflammation, sleep, injury, energy levels, all the lights, you, you start to notice these things and it tends to be when something goes wrong that you really can sit them down and start to get that buy-in. But the guys that figure it out, your Ronaldo's and the likes, they they figured it out on the, their journey, how important it is and how many effects and how much time it can add on to your career. It can add years onto your career, good nutrition and add elements onto your performance. It won't make an average person a champion, but it can certainly limit a champion if they're not following good nutritional practices. So it's people like Ronaldo are really putting it out there that they live live it to the highest level. Um, so it's definitely getting better, but you still be mega surprised at how bad it can be. Yeah, I, I, that was one of my questions, actually. I mean, is, is it a shock to you how prevalent lack of dedication is because you know uh, as we said there excessive drinking smoking uh poor diet was was kind of a hallmark of yesteryear you, you talked uh we would talk about george best almost as as maybe an atypical example of going out the night before and then being almost half drunk on the pitch it does that happen now i mean is that realistic can you be an elite sports person with that kind of lifestyle um, it happens less and less, um, and lifestyle, like I said, will catch up with it yeah, in the main because it is so less and less. It's the out of the norm now, so it does stand out over time. So that can be addressed. There's still it's a working class sport, and lads like going out and free. They're just the human beings at the end of the day. Everyone needs a bit of release valve. So I'm not saying go out and have the occasional cheat meal or whatever you want to call it, have a few drinks now and again. People need that in their life. I certainly enjoy doing things like that as, as well. So I'm not going to preach to somebody some, something that I think kind of brings a bit of enjoyment into my life. But Generation X, the modern player, it's just a total different social demographic to... Uh, uh, the older generation, they typically don't drink anywhere near as much on the society level as a whole. Um, so there's that factor and there's different elements to socialising now. So you, you see all the pubs that are shutting and the likes. It's People go out later and it makes more folks or a lot of more of the interaction is done on social media. So just inherently, I think um, there's, there's less and less of that drinking culture for certain. Um, we've got another listener question now, and they've asked, what would all players benefit from incorporating into their diet? 
can be a specific vitamin protein or or anything that you feel that any person can have benefit from just eating more vegetables it's always my biggest uh battleground hardest thing to change with people but it'll be overall the most rewarding thing that they can do so i'm not going to get over complicated to that i've explained why they're so good for you in, in multiple aspects great for the earth as well um so yeah that that would be my answer but too simplistic for what they probably want but that would be the thing um there's loads of there's this implosion of health supplements at the moment so things like turmeric ginger and the likes and they they can be really good but you don't have to spend fortunes um buying these products you can make your own with a little bit of knowledge in there as well and having them regular within foods which is going to make your foods take absolutely amazing as well as all the health benefits i think that's the best way for most of us to go around it and also another listener question was would you say water is seriously underrated I've got two aspects of this. All right, uh, most of our body is around two-thirds water, so that shows you straight away how important it is. And if you're dehydrated, the science is absolutely clear that it hampers your performance, your mental clarity, your fat-burning ability, loads of things and could potentially be really dangerous. But we have excellent mechanisms for regulating our hydration levels. Our thirst pretty much tells us when we need to drink and don't drink, and drinking water is the most recommended uh, hydration method. It's when it comes to, like we've recently had, 40 degrees, high humidity, that's when we need to be a bit more clever and not just rely on our thirst. So you might be using things like electrolyte tablets in those circumstances to so retain more of the fluids that you come in and you maintain a stronger thirst in there as well. You might be doing things like checking the urine color um, so if it's starting to go really dark, that could indicate that you do need to top up your fluids. If it's reasonably clear, it's not shouldn't be crystal clear, but if it's reasonably clear, you're, you're in the right state. We'd also do things like weigh players before and after matches because they're sweating significant amounts. Like just in 60 minutes the other day, we had people do, putting out over two litres. So that's super important to educate them. Do you a sweat a bit more than the most person, and how concentrated is is that sweat in terms of um, sodium mainly, but also potassium that you can measure as well? And do you need uh, potentially a stronger electrolyte to help you replace those minerals within your body quite quickly? But vast majority of the time, cold climate like ours, just rely on your thirst and gen- generally drink water, sugar free cordials. Um, Teas and coffees aren't too bad, as long as we're not overdoing them. Um, they're not great. I don't know why I threw that in there. Actually, they're not that great for hydration because caffeine has does have some dehydrant, uh, dehydrating elements within there. Um, but yeah, water is the main thing, and just stick to your thirst. Well, I do want to talk about coffee or caffeine-related products as well. Do you find that they're Maybe not an enemy, but an inhibitor to a lot of people's success. Uh, it's very uh, um, individualistic for specific, specific. So we have a certain genome that affects how quickly we break down caffeine. So I very much know that I'm a slow breakdowner. So I have to drink decaf now. If I have uh, a normal coffee now, I'm a nervous wreck. I'm like a hummingbird running around the place, grinding my teeth and the lights can't have any. After five o'clock, it's, it's going to affect my sleep. But my wife is completely different. She can walk down a double espresso before she goes to bed. So it's very individualistic. Caffeine is, again, one of the stronger supplement uh, research elements that it does have good performance effects so something like um a cup of cup and a half of coffee would have the right amount of caffeine in there to generally boost most people's performance it boosts it from mainly from cognitive reasons so mental reasons so you, the exercise just feels a bit better but you it generally it's what why we have coffee it just makes us a little bit more alert it makes our nervous system a little bit brighter it makes us to be able to uh, take fuels and signaling molecules around the body a little bit quicker. So we're just a bit more on that edge of performance, but you can 
be somebody that tips into that other level of going too far. So it's that affects your con- cognition too much because you're overhyped, you're jittery, you're more likely to get things like cramp because you're taking your body beyond its normal levels than it can go to. So super common in things like uh most sports really a bit of caffeine to do performance but you have to be very careful with individualistic dosing and there's other th- pro- loads of products out there where you can take tablets or little shots that give you stronger amounts but don't just do that your first time before an important event you need to test yourself out in more of training based circumstances that aren't as important i'd say that for any nutritional strategy don't do it the first time before you're doing something important because you don't know how your body's going to react to that your digestive system how sensitive you're going to be to a certain element so caffeine very good but test it out first Uh, i want to bring us to uh, an examination of english football versus the continent or maybe even lower levels as well from the data from our data and everything workloads etc etc the schedule of english football is the most demanding in europe the most sprints uh, everything to do with that uh, but because of these more demands do english league players need a much different diet from those in germany or spain or is it not as pronounced as one might assume I think it's just slight differences based on there'll be more around performance and recovery and a little bit less around health and weight maintenance. But within the squad, you've got lots of different uh, diverse needs because there might be a sub, there might be a non-squad. So you've you've got a variation within your squad. It can't just be a, a global attack on your philosophy is it has to be very individualized as well. But yeah, I think, again, just keeping it quite simple, we have a horrific uh, fix to congestion for the last three three seasons relating to COVID and now into the World Cup where we're just pushing our players too far. It's showing with the injury records. It's showing like with burnout, with the performance levels at the end of the season when they're going into international competitions. It's just too much for the players. And that, like this year, they're sending them to the World Cup and they're still making them have the first game on uh, Christmas Day when they come back. It's just an obscene level of exposure for these players. The great, great squads who are probably going to be play the most because they're involved in the most competitions. They're fortunate enough to have two or three players for every position now so they can rotate a little bit, but they're still going to always pick like your Kevin De Bruyne is for the vast majority of games because they need to and they're just getting pushed too far now, which is, I think, a more interesting topic than around nutrition and, and certainly around injuries as well, which is obviously a special speciality of you guys. Uh, I actually want to bring it on to a recent example as well. I'm sure you're aware of it too. Uh, it was recently re- revealed that nutrition has played a key part on Mikel Antonio's successful season in 2021-22. He's now not sustained a hamstring injury since October of 2020. Uh, how much of a role would diet have actually played in this? I haven't heard about that, but I know the nutritionist down there, Matt Jones, and he's epic. He's really, really good, really kind of, he's revealed a lot to me on like you have all these kind of written down goals, but achieving them like for the variation in carb levels and things just doesn't exist in the real world. So it's about tweaking to try and get as near to them rather than just having these levels that they're just people aren't getting anywhere near. Um, so, yeah, I've learned loads from that. I've got his template as well for recovery strategies after game, which identifies four windows and what food should, what amount of uh, macros you should go in there and food examples, how you can do that. So I've learned loads from that as well. So I'm not surprised he's, he's, uh, he's done so well under him as well. But I wasn't aware of the article, but that, that's great to hear. And yeah, it is important. It's not the be-all and end-all nutrition, but it's a massive part in the whole picture, the whole picture, injuries, mood, performance, inflammation, health. It just goes on and on and on. And if you could get the benefits of a good nutrition in a pill, we could just take it. You're in the single person in the world that wouldn't be doing it, but we still don't have the fortitude to 
follow a general good nutrition diet, a lot of us. Uh, I just wanted to ask a specific question on this. Uh, obviously, you you said it. You're not to a fay with the story itself, but what I found quite fascinating looking at this was he was experiencing one hamstring after another after another, and so he actively sought the advice from the club's performance department, not the other way around. I, I was just interested how that relationship works with player and performance department. Um, what, why would it not have been flagged up by the performance department that we need to actively change Antonio's? Is that not how it works at a football club? I'm very, I'd be very, very surprised if a club with a stature of West Ham and I know a lot of the staff down there wouldn't be already approaching that from a holistic point of view, particularly the, uh, the medical department. So I, in, in all reality, I find that a little difficult to believe. But everybody, the great players, not just they don't just get coached, they self-coach as well. They have a vision and strategy and a lot. That's their free time when they're away from the club and that's quite significant where then they have to take control and coach themselves. So maybe he recognised in that area the certain elements where within his lifestyle he could make significant improvements and was aware of them and has approached them a bit more aggressively. But he'll have had holistic support from so many areas, from medical, nutrition, psychological, chiropractic, dentist, blah, blah, blah. He'll have had everything I know he will have done. But I think that element of him being more aware and more focused might have been the trigger. And the great, great players, look in history, their quotes, they know how to coach themselves, the problem solve, and know how to get over hurdles. Uh, I want to ask one other area, uh, again, link it to the book, but sleep is, is being explored more and more. There's so much growth in literature about it. How can diet help with improving your sleep? And then again, it's, it's almost like every bit of your lifestyle is interlinked to, to success, whether it be athletic, but also just in life in general. Yeah, there's quite a lot of science around it, though. So there's certain foods that are higher in things called like tryptophan and melatonin, and this is kind of our happy hormone that allows us to go to sleep and really varies with the, our day-night cycles as well. So things like milk uh, are, are quite high in there, um, and they, they can help, and there's a lot of supplements that, that are now on the market that are going to help promote that carbohydrates as well. They promote more of a sleep hormone state than protein does. Protein tends to be the opposite. So the general recommendation for someone going to bed might to have like a, a bit of oats or something like that. But, but they'll have some protein in there because it's important that they have this slow release of protein overnight in, the, in there. And it might have elements in there that increase this amount of melatonin and think, but... I think it's overhyped, the science behind it. Not the importance, but the importance is, is just the, the general things, the general winding down. Don't be on your phone. Don't be doing too many stimulating things. Make sure you've got good slight sleep hygiene in there so it's a nice, cool, dark envi environment and just have that wind down period and don't go to bed too late. And then if you get if, if this magic window of like eight hours, everybody varies again. But typically, if you get between seven and nine hours and you go into bed, ideally b before 11, um, you're going to have your best kind of sleep cycles within there as well. Super important, but I think being overhyped in terms of all these necessary behaviors to achieve sleep and maybe doing it a disservice with that because it's a massive problem in society, but it's a massive problem relating to stress and um overuse of phones and, and things like that. Uh, and so I, w I want to bring it kind of maybe to, to summarise what we've chatted about. Can the read of your book or, or people using the app as well, can they get the feeling that they are getting elite level meal plans? You know, for example, play X comes to you, they want to change, they want to improve themselves. Would you be giving them the plans that are in the book for them to, to actually have in real life? Is, is that exactly the sort of information you'd be passing on to an elite sports person? 
Yeah, I mean, the, the, we've done a number of meal plans for numerous goals that already existed within the app, and they were generated around elite sport mainly. Um, so we had them for multiple sports, um, different weight categories and the like, different health goals, different body shape goals, like losing weight, increasing health. We had over 70 of those uh, kind of interactive meal plans on there. And we've took them and we've adapted them slightly to involve more, not just meals that within the book, but also just generic foods. So just fruit and things like that that you can grab, a simple sandwich and the likes. Um, so really simplistic, easy to follow meal plans that are in there, but generally designed on a quite sophisticated elite level. Um, so yeah, it's it's making them accessible as possible, but they're still really designed. There's a logic behind everything that goes into the meal plans. And it's the covered right down for your absolute novice athlete, right up to your kind of elite amateur for all your different sports and, and different needs in there as well. So there's a number of meal plans in there. So, yeah, they're at a real high level, but super easy to understand and reasonably easy to follow. But like I said, just providing someone with just a basic meal plan and expect them to just follow that to the T it's not going to happen in the real world. It, they have to have that knowledge to make it nuanced to their tastes, their economics, et cetera, et cetera. And we try and provide that within the book. And how does one track progress? I mean, what apps work well? What would you, what would you recommend to use in tandem with the ColorFit book? Depends on what your goal is. So obviously if it's performance, look at your performance levels and how how could you feel the next day in terms of recovery if it's to do with body shape and you want to lose weight, just look at yourself in the mirror. You can weigh yourself. I won't worry about it too much. Um, if you're happy with the progress that you're seeing in the mirror, the eyes, it's so clever, your brain, the eyes tell you a million things. So maybe a picture of yourself every two to three weeks, something like that, looking at change, you'll see the changes in your clothes. So keep it super simple. You don't have to get to the point where you're doing very specific body fat analysis or anything like that. Just very commonsensical things. Most people already know. They don't need me to tell them how they're going to achieve the goals. They'll, they'll know that they're kind of achieving them. And the final question for you is where to find the book? Where can people find more about the amazing work that you do? Um, the book, probably easiest place is in on Amazon. So if you just put in the colour fit method, um, sometimes it needs a dash between the colour and fit, but on Amazon it's certainly done. I've been told on Apple Books it, that it does. It should be in all good bookstores. So if you go in and ask for it, I'm sure it will be in there. Um, and then more information about the company can be found on our socials. So they're at Hero Pro Sports. The website is www.at sorry www.herosports.com um and i'm thomas little on linkedin if they want to get in in touch with me as well so yeah feel free to reach out <laughs> well tom it has been an absolute pleasure to chat to you today you've answered some listener questions as well so i'm sure they'll be absolutely ecstatic about that but i do recommend people to look at the book it was so fun to read i, I really enjoyed it and there's certainly things that i'm going to be adopting in my lifestyle but thank you so much for your time today Oh, thank you so much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be on and uh, hope you keep continue to have the good, great guests on the show that you've been producing.